Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again, it's time for the Q&A, so let's go ahead and knock this out. All right, first question. Jason, do you think one can hammer away at specific exercises to bring up weak points on a daily basis if one does not go to failure? For instance, 200 chins per day spread out and not going to failure, or tons of lateral raises to bring with side delt slash reverse wrist curls to bring up forearms, etc. Cheers. Uh, yes and no. It's not really about the not going to failure, because that doesn't really bring up the weak points the way that you think it would. In fact, one of the examples you gave, the chins. With me weighing 220 at the time, last year I did a phase where I did 100 chins every day. Actually led to a lot of shoulder inflammation, and now I find that for me personally, I can't do chin-ups or pull-ups anymore. Right? They aggravate my shoulders. Although for a while, I got really, really, really good benefit out of it. Right? Uh, big movements like that, you need to be careful about what you're doing with that. Especially for any extended period of time. And some people are going to disagree, and I even made videos on that, and I've had clients who continue to do that after watching me do it, wanted to do it, who've never had issues. But here's the point we get to. You're, you're really at a certain point just building work capacity, because it's the submaximal work itself like that may not put on that much muscle. So if you're talking about bringing up weak points, other than maybe helping your grip, not so much. It, that's really a work capacity thing. You're almost doing that as a form of general physical preparedness. What do we mean weak points? If it's weak points, you need to stick with smaller movements. And this is coming from a strength guy who believes 90% of our training should be with big exercises. Okay, Big exercises. I do small movements every day. You want to know what they are right now? Band press downs for my triceps. Pretty much to failure. Rear delt pull apart for the band. Grip work. Right? Stuff like that. Reverse hypers. Very high reps. These are all small movements. They're all restoration type movements. Okay? I pick exercises that don't cause inflammation. Again, bands is a perfect example. If you have certain body parts that need extra work, it's not just about the training for them. It's about building work capacity and recovery. Not just about just the stimulation of the training. Because we could just do more work. And I want you to understand that. You're not going to grow faster on a movement just because you're doing it every day. Compared to if you actually just did more volume on the main sets. Some of these movements, it's a recovery issue. It's a connective tissue issue. We're trying to build tendons, We're trying to build recovery, other stuff in these muscles. That's where you go to something like that. And a lot of big movements, it's not going to work. It's going to be problematic from a recovery perspective. Trying to build tendon health, trying to build blood flow, in addition to whatever stimulation you're getting. You need to stick with smaller movements and be careful with what you pick. Band exercises are great if you're going to do an actual muscle group every day. A big movement, not so much. Right? Be selective in what you pick and think through. Is this an exercise that can cause tendonitis or can it relieve tendonitis? We need to be thinking in terms of restoration. Right? What the West Side guys call restoration training. Same thing. The Boogs, Eric Bugenhagen does the same sort of stuff for some of his arms and stuff. High rep band work every day. That's different. Because it's different than your traditional training. It beats up recovery. Totally different. All right, next question. What's the best way to train for a one-arm pull-up? Is it a realistic goal for someone 200 plus pounds? I don't know. What's the best way to train for a bench press? All right, you, you understand this is not a magical exercise. Not a magical exercise. Is it realistic for someone 200 plus pounds? I would say from an injury perspective, no. But if you're trying to win a one-arm pull-up contest, like as a competitive athlete, by all means, knock yourself out. Um, this is one of these movements, though, to where you have to be realistic. A guy who's 200 plus pounds. You're going to put a lot of wear and tear on your shoulders doing this. And people say, well, you would too, getting to whatever lift. Not the same. 
not the same. Getting to a 400 pound bench press is not going to put the same wear and tear on your shoulders that learning to do a pull up with one arm will is an isolateral movement. So if you think about, oh man, getting to a 400 bench could wreck my shoulders. If you think that's even remotely a risk, you shouldn't even be considering something like this. It's way higher. And it's basically a lifetime type goal. Uh, I, I mean, basically, when you're talking about for a guy who's over 200 pounds, to get to the point to where you can do one-arm pull-ups is, is literally on par with aiming for a 450-pound bench press, a 700-pound deadlift, whatever. The amount of work in, that you're going to have to put in is going to be the equivalent to something like that because of scaling and body weight. Okay, we're not talking about a guy who weighs 160, 165. If you're 220, this is, this is a ridiculous goal. Like you're talking ultra elite strength at that point. You're going to basically dedicate your life to it. And it's not a contested lift. So basically you'd be dedicating your life for the next three or four or five years to reaching a goal in a non-competitive lift. Which if that's what you want to do, by all means, knock yourself out. Just be aware of that. For most guys, this is this is not going to be a realistic goal. Right? And this is coming from someone who says everyone should be able to deadlift 500 pounds. That's a realistic goal for every healthy man. By comparison, this is not. Well, there's, there's your perspective on it. But if you want to do it, knock yourself out. You're going to have to get basically the strongest lats and biceps and grip that you can possibly get. That's what you're going to have to do. Right? You have to train them into the ground, lifting variations, maximizing hypertrophy. Right? So you're going to have to do. And then focus on body composition. Maybe even thinking about, I don't want to add muscle in the wrong places. I need to be really lean. Right? All of those things. That's what you're going to have to look at. I don't know that there's a best way to train for it. It's such an extreme goal. It's like asking, how do you train for a 700-pound deadlift? Well, that's going to be a very complicated, long process. Like, someone would almost need to sit down and write a book on this. Who has a lot of experience doing it. Alright, next question. Why does it seem unpopular to perform squat slash box squats for volume on max effort squat day in conjugate programs? I've seen many conjugate programs that only have the max effort squat and then no other exercises after that for the interior chain quads. Surely you need more volume than that. I'm trying to create an intermediate program for myself using conjugate, and it's something I noticed. Thanks. Yeah. Well, here's my question. Why, why do you think you need it? And if you needed some extra quad work, throw some quad work in. Like, wh why do you need volume quad work for squats? You can squat to a max. You can squat for speed. That covers what you need out of a squat. It's a lot of compressive stress on your spine. A lot of recovery on squats. But you go drag a sled. You do some isolateral leg work. You could do hip belt squats. You could do all those other things and get a better stimulus to fatigue and better overall benefit if your goal is just quads. And I'll also be honest with you. I, I also have lifters who've never done any quad movements who've gone from early intermediate to advanced lifters. Hey, I have advanced lifters who've never done a single quad exercise outside of their, their squatting and deadlifting on the normal conjugate. Like, no supplemental stuff there, unless you count deficit deadlifts for quads. I, I have them. They're there. So let me ask you the question, what, why is it that you think that you need it? Like, do you have a legitimate need? Like, is your quads actually a real problem? Or are you getting enough from even your, your speed days? That's what you have to factor in. You say, what do you mean? Well, we deal with the frequency issue. It's not universally accepted or proven that we need minimum effective volume multiple times per week. You can do one really high volume day with some other work. And your other squatting and pulling is still working quads. And you have to remember that. Speed days are usually quite a bit of squat of quad work. Right? Speed boxes, speed sumos. And then your GPP and stuff adds in. Like if you're dragging a sled, my like my god, if you're doing sled drags on top of that, you're fine. You have no problem building 600, 550 pound squat quads. 
you need to focus upon what's going to give you the most bang for your buck. Is that where you need to be focusing your efforts if you want to get to a 500 pound squat as quickly as you can from where you are? That's what you have to ask the question. Is it the best use of your resources? Is it really? You need to think about it. It might be. Probably isn't. But it might be. It could be the exception. So think on that for a moment. Is that really where you need to put your work? Or could you just go drag a sled once or twice a week and be done with it? All right, guys. Well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.